We're on our fourth week of our sermon series, which we've simply entitled, God Meant It for Good. As you know, this is a series on the life of Joseph. Now, if you've missed the previous sermons, we encourage you to check them out in our website at livingwordnra.com. In our story today, the tide has finally turned for Joseph as he is called before the Pharaoh, whom we know has just had a bad dream. Now I've just entitled the message today, Detours and Deliverance. Detours and Deliverance. We're going to read the portion where Joseph responds to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 41, verses 25 to 37. Let's read the word of God. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that come up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for the life lessons that we are learning from Joseph, for reminding us that you are with us in every aspect of our lives. Once again, we come humbly asking that you grant us hearts and ears that are willing to listen to your voice. And we ask today that through this message, you will give us hope and perspective of seeing your hand in our lives. In Christ we pray, amen and amen. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the 16th century, can one time have a faith that could move mountains and then at times struggle with doubts that can rival that of an atheist. One particular period in his life, he was in such despair that his friends were concerned how he might act or what he might say. They encouraged him to take a sabbatical, which he did, but he came back just as gloomy and as despondent as he was when he left. There was deep uneasiness and concern that he might abandon the Reformation movement had it not been for the intervention of his wife, Catherine. So one day, Martin Luther came home to find his wife dressed in black and weeping. And to her side was a black cloak, the kind worn by women at funerals. And Martin Luther immediately thought that something bad had happened. What's the matter, he asked. Is our child dead? And Catherine responded, oh no, the family is fine, but something far worse has happened. And Luther, according to the story, said, what has befallen us? Tell me quick. I am sad enough as it is. Tell me quick. Good man, Catherine answered. Have you not heard? Is it possible that the terrible news has not reached you? And Luther shook his head and and urged her for an explanation. And she said, Have you not been told that our Heavenly Father is dead and that His cause in the world is therefore overturned? And Luther looked at his wife for the longest time 
and gradually a smile came to his face and then laughter. And he said to his wife, Catherine, I read your riddle. What a fool I have been. God is not dead. He lives forever. But I have acted as if he were. Martin Luther is not the first nor the last person to write the obituary of God. He's not the first person nor the last to pass through a period of time in which you'd think God was dead by the expression of his face and by the way he lived his life. We probably all have one time or another done that. Even the strongest of faiths can be weakened by the stresses that we sometimes feel in life that that comes from sadness, sudden disappointments, and despair. And when those struggles come, we, we become sitting ducks for a faith crisis. We ask questions like, does God care? Is he good? Is he able? What good can come out of this? And it's during those times when we have to wrestle and remember and focus on who God is. We hold tightly to the truth of his goodness, his sovereignty, and his power. That God is good even when the outcome isn't. That God is powerful even when you're at the losing end. And that God is sovereign even when things look bleak. You and I must come to terms with the fact that God knows what he is doing even when we don't. God knows what he is doing even when we don't, that he is never clueless even when we don't have a clue. God is never taken by surprise. He is never asleep. He never loses control and that he ultimately has a purpose. And that's probably the reason why we so love the story of Joseph sold at the age of 17 by his brothers to a bunch of Midianite travelers who took him down to Egypt. There he was, sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar. He worked his way up in that household only to be accused of something he didn't do. He ended up in jail where he languished for at least two years with no hope of ever getting out. And we can count at least two betrayals one broken promise, several outbursts of hatred, two abductions, sexual harassment, ten jealous brothers, and a case of poor parenting. Abuse, unjust imprisonment, mix all of that together and let it sit for 13 years. And yet when we read chapter 41, we see a dramatic reversal of his situation. Jacob's forgotten son has become the second most powerful man in Egypt. The path from the pit to prison and then to the palace was not quick. It wasn't painless. But wouldn't you say that God took the mess and made it into something good? The links in the chain of providence are finally showing up. Now we all love a a rags to riches story. And part of the reason why we so resonate with the story of Joseph is because we all can relate. We want that, right? We imagine pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, you know, and by sheer talent and, and ingenuity, we get ourselves out of a situation, we climb up to the top. But you know what? Scripture's version of the rags to riches story isn't like our version. In Scripture, the rags to riches story isn't about the riches at all, but about the God who humbles and exalts. It's about a God who lifts up the lowly. It's about a God who brings about deliverance of a nation from a famine. It's not about the hard work and and the diligence of its character, but the action and the grace of the God who calls. And the central message points us to God who gives Joseph the words to speak, to God who exalts Joseph, to a God who brings about the means of salvation for the people at that time. Because God knows what he is doing even when we don't. So let's remember that when we look at the story of Joseph in chapter 41. Joseph is now about 30 years old. He was 17 when when he was thrown into the pit and about 27 when he landed in prison. It's been two years, and now finally, a breakthrough. 
But we all know it didn't come easy for him. Now I believe Joseph had to grapple with this issue of, of God's nature when he faced the realities of the detours of life. And so do we. It's easy to say God is good when things go our way. Praise the Lord, I got the job. Praise the Lord, I got healed from cancer. Praise God, I got the scholarship. But can we say the same when circumstances are different? In the cemetery, when a loved one passes away. In the unemployment line, when we're out of a job. In the doctor's office, when we are sick. Is God always good? Is God always in control? Now, Joseph's words to Pharaoh reveal to us a man who has wrestled with all of this. Now, we don't typically think of Joseph as a theologian like Paul. We know him as a, a statesman, a leader, an administrator. But at the core of his words, and there aren't many of them, we will see a man who, though he struggled with pain, with betrayal, with slavery, and imprisonment, who in spite of and in the midst of it all has decided that he believes in God in the good times and in the bad. Joseph's words to Pharaoh gives us insight into his heart for God, and I want to share these insights with you today. But before that, just a quick context on how he got to where he was. Remember, he was in prison for two years, and apparently, he's been sleeping okay. But the Pharaoh didn't sleep well. He kept waking up because of these dreams. In dream number one, he saw seven cows, seven fat cows. Now, while these cows were grazing, seven ugly, thin, anemic cows come and ate them all up. Then he had a second dream. Seven healthy heads of grain were growing from a stalk of grain, and then seven thin, withered heads came and consumed them. Here's what happens next. Genesis chapter 41, verse 8 reads, In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. And among that group must have been the cupbearer because somehow he got word that Pharaoh was in need of somebody to interpret dreams. And the cupbearer promptly remembered Joseph from his prison days two years ago, whose interpretation of his dream and the baker's dream came true. So the cupbearer tells the Pharaoh about Joseph, and Pharaoh issues the command, and now Joseph is shaven, he's cleaned up, he's dressed, and he's brought to stand in front of the king. The Pharaoh then tells him the dream, and Joseph interprets the dream for him. Now, as we look at the words of Joseph, I want you to observe three things. These words reveal to us the heart of a man, though life has been hard on him, it shows to us a man who has settled in his mind that God is in charge and that God can be depended on. And because he understood this, we see its effect on the life of Joseph. First, it affected his mindset. It affected his mindset. Notice what he says in these verses. Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Genesis 41, verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Genesis chapter 41, verse 28. It is just as I had said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And Genesis chapter 41, verse 32. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. You notice something? Five times in four verses, Joseph talks about God. Remember Mrs. Potiphar when she tried to seduce him? What did he say? How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? When his fellow prisoners asked 
for an interpretation of their dreams, Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? God, 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 God. What was on Joseph's mind? God. He lived with the awareness that God was active, that God was able, and that God was doing something to fulfill his purposes. What's on your mind? The economy, the economy, the economy, the economy. No job, no job. Quarantine, quarantine. Kapui, kapui, kapui. Do we not make the same mistake that Martin Luther made? Do we not at times in our lives live as if there is no God and forget Him? And does Joseph not remind us that the secret to strength in tough times is a mind that is focused on God, that is consumed with God, a mind that, that does everything possible to hear God, then keeps God speaking, keeps listening, keeps his Bible open, the song singing, the fellowship happening, and is absolutely determined to let God break in and speak through. You don't need fewer problems. You need more God. I know I do. I would love for all my problems to be gone, but it's not going to happen this side of heaven. A problem-free life is never going to happen in this planet. And God has Joseph's today. He has them all over in the offices, in the schools, he has them in the companies. He has them in government. He has men and women who are inclining their ears and defining their lives, not by their problems, not by their circumstances, not by what they do, but by who God is in their lives. You just need more God. Are you that person? Is your mind saturated with thoughts of our Lord that you always look at life in light of who God is? Is God in your mind? Well, for Joseph, God was clearly in his mind. Now, secondly, we see that Joseph's understanding of God's sovereign power not only affected his mindset, it also affected his perspective. You know, so much of what goes on around us make little sense. Just think of the mysteries of life, how one person gets cancer and dies while another person doesn't get cancer, and yet another person gets the same cancer and, and goes through chemotherapy and survives. Why does one child live and another die? Why is one person hit with a series of trials? Why did this husband decide to walk away from his marriage? Why did the car wreck leave this woman crippled while the man next to her walked away uninjured? Why was this person promoted and that one passed over? Why do some people want to get married but never find the right person? And the list goes on and on and on. Now, Pharaoh had two dreams. He was disturbed. He couldn't sleep. He, he needed answers. And God sends Joseph and Joseph when asked to interpret the dream, says this in verse 16. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Joseph the answer he desires. You know, most of the time we can't see any clear answers to the questions of life. We barely get a glimmer of all that is God is doing in us, through us, to us, and for us. It's like we're peering through a keyhole. At best, we see a very small portion of what lies on the other side of the door. It's like we're peering through a keyhole. At best, we see a very small portion of what lies on the other side of the door. What we have is keyhole perspective. You know, John Piper illustrates it for us like this. He says that every day, God is doing perhaps 10,000 different things in your life, but you will only be dimly aware of perhaps three of those things. Of course, the numbers are arbitrary, but the point is absolutely right. You know, a few weeks ago, I was reflecting on the story of Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis, and the Lord brought this point to me. Now, we know that Abraham had a son named Ishmael from his 
uh, from Sarah's servant, Hagar. Finally, by a miracle, Sarah did bear a son of her own named Isaac. And God told Abraham that his descendants will follow the line of Isaac. Now in Genesis chapter 41, I read something so heartbreaking. In a fit of jealousy, Sarah had asked Abraham to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. And this grieved Abraham because Ishmael was also his son. But the Lord told Abraham that he would take care of Ishmael and that Ishmael would become a nation one day. And so Hagar and Ishmael, with, with nothing but some food and water, were let go by Abraham. They walked out into the wilderness until their water ran out. And at this point, Hagar was so heartbroken and devastated, she was ready to die. But God, God intervened. In, interesting is what God did, and we can read that in Genesis chapter 21, verse 19. It says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Now, why did God have to open her eyes? Didn't she see the well of water? And as I thought of that, I realized that there are times that the trials of life cause us to be blind to see what God has provided for us. And like Hagar, we, we forget what we know about God. For example, remember in Genesis chapter 16, God revealed himself to her and, and she called God Elroy, meaning the God who sees me. But when things go bad, we forget who he is, his promises, and just look in despair at our situation. We open our hands and pray for what we think we need to receive instead of asking God to open our eyes to see what He has already given and promised to us. And yes, I'm like that. And pretty much I'm sure you're like that too. Truth is, we all view life, especially the hard times, with a keyhole perspective unless God opens our eyes Joseph knew this he knew God had the answer he knew God can make you see he knew that he can give us perspective and what we need to do is humble ourselves before our great God and ask him to open our eyes crisis or no crisis our perspective in life affects our response and makes us see how we desperately need God. I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires, as Joseph says. God is in charge, and this affected Joseph's mindset and his perspective. Thirdly, it also affected his conviction. Picture with me on that day in the courts of the Egyptian palace, Pharaoh on one side, Joseph on the other, the king, the ex-con. Pharaoh from the palace, Joseph from the prison. Pharaoh with his gold chains and, and Joseph who still had bruises from the prison chains. Pharaoh with his armies and pyramids and, and Joseph with his borrowed robe and nothing else. But when you look again at the words of Joseph, you cannot help but see the confidence of this young man as he spoke. He heard the dreams and went straight to work. No need to consult any advisor. Expect seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. No one, including the Pharaoh, knew how to respond. Famine was not a good word in the Egyptian dictionary. Their civilization was built on farms. Crops made Egypt the jewel of the Nile. Agriculture had made Pharaoh the most powerful man in the world. A month of famine would hurt the economy. A year-long famine would hurt the throne of Pharaoh because he owned the fields by the Nile. A seven-year famine would destroy them. And I can't help but think of the parallel that we have in our day. You probably read and know about how the COVID pandemic and the quarantine have deeply affected not only our nation, but also individual lives. You already have churchmates and loved ones who are experiencing the crunch as, as this quarantine is once more extended. Many people are anxious today. 
How long will this last? Will, will I have work after this? Can I find work after this? And, and while the students are worried about whether they will pass their classes, we have parents and families who are worried about what will happen with their dwindling resources if this goes on. How can I feed my family? How will we be able to pay the bills after this? The uncertainty about this pandemic is kind of like the famine that Joseph is talking about. But here's what I want you to notice in Joseph's words. It's his conviction about who God is. Genesis chapter 41, 32, we read again. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. In fact, you will read the same sense repeated three times in verses 45, in 20, verse 28, and verse 32. Joseph was not impressed by Pharaoh. He was impressed by God. And though Pharaoh was the mightiest man on earth, he was helpless to understand even his own dream. Joseph is letting this mighty king know that he is nothing in the sight of God who is able to send prosperity and famine as he wants. And Joseph was telling the Pharaoh that God directs all things towards an appointed end. Now, why was Joseph so bold? I mean, this was not necessarily good news he was talking about. A crisis is going to happen. I think it's because Joseph has this understanding that God is sovereign, that God is overseeing both the seven good years and the seven bad years. God has decreed this, Joseph says. God will bring this to pass. What? He will bring to pass the good times and he's going to bring to pass the tough times. Perhaps many of us need to hear that. God will bring this pandemic to pass as well. And the question for us Christians is this, who is in charge? Joseph knew God was in charge. And I think one of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves today is this, why are we so anxious? Aren't we convinced that God is in charge? Do we believe that God ultimately has our good in his mind? I know I don't know about you, but I love a good cup of coffee. In fact, my day would not be complete without me having a cup of coffee and, you know, I like a splash of milk to go with it. And I'll say, you know, when I drink a cup of coffee and I drink it and say, you know what? That's good. That's good. Now, what do I mean when I say that's good? A am I saying that if I were to bite on the plastic bag that contains the coffee beans, that that would be good? Or, or if I, I take a handful of the coffee beans and, and swallow them, would that be good? Or if I were to take a coffee filter and, and chew on it, would that be good? The hot water is not good. And definitely, I don't want to chew on the cup. That's not very good. Good happens when the ingredients work together. The bag is opened, the beans ground into powder, mixed with the right dosage, and the water heated at the right temperature. It's when all of that comes together and you can say, Ah, you know what? That's pretty good. You know, nothing in the Bible calls a famine good or a pandemic good or a heart attack good or, or cancer good. Unemployment, sexual harassment, poverty. These are terrible things that happen born out of a fallen world. We cannot call them good. Yet every message in the Bible, especially the story of Joseph, compels us to believe that God is able to mix all of them together and other ingredients and, and bring good out of them. And if you're a Christian, God promises that all things will work together for good. Now we must, of course, let God define good because our definition most likely includes good health, comfort, money, recognition. But God defines good not necessarily in those terms. In the case of his son, Jesus Christ, the good consisted of struggles, of rejection, of pain, and death. But God worked it all together for the greatest good, for his glory, and for our salvation. 
You know, Joseph would later on in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, say, say those famous words to his brothers. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for, for good. Now, I think even at his very first meeting with Pharaoh, Joseph already had this conviction. And truth is, it's not easy. Because everything in our society says, don't believe. Everything in our society says, only trust that which you can touch, that which you can see. Everything in our society says, you're only as good as the money in your pocket or, or the diploma on your wall. Everything in our society measures success in life by wealth, by fame, by power, and by accomplishment. And God says that he is high above all this and he can call a pharaoh to wake up in the middle of the night. He can get pharaoh anxious and he can bring a Joseph into the world. And just like that, everything can change. Are you anxious today? Know that God is good and that he is in control and that he's able to mix all of the things that happen in life together for good. And that's a promise. Joseph knew God was in charge. And more than that, Joseph knew the God who is in charge. And I pray that like Joseph, our mindset and our perspective and our conviction will be transformed. And most especially as, as we face this COVID crisis, may the peace of God dwell richly in our hearts and in our minds. Two Christian friends were driving around one day and the other friend asked to borrow the other friend's phone. And he noticed that his friend's phone was locked with an unusual password. And the password spelled pro-nobis. So the other friend asked him, what is pro-nobis? What does it mean? And why did he choose that word as his password? And this friend explained to him that, you know what, it's from the Latin word that means for us. And then he started to choke up as he began to explain. Because after a period of personal pain, his healing came when he learned that God is for us. And that Latin phrase, pro nobis. He had entered a season of difficulty as he assumed that God didn't care and that God had given up on him. But he finally found hope through those two simple words and he used that as his password to remind himself that god is for us pro nobis you see when he decided to believe that god was for him for us that god had sent his only son to die for him he could then lay down his life and surrendered his cares to the lord romans 8 puts it this way romans 8 31 and 32 what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? When life is uncertain, don't ever forget, God is pro nobis god is for us he demonstrated that very clearly when he sent his son jesus christ to die on the cross for our sin and all you have to do is trust him with your life and then by his grace believe in the action and the grace of the one who has called us into his marvelous light because god knows what he is doing even when we don't let's pray lord today we once again thank you for your word thank you for the encouragement that you have given to us father would you strengthen our faith even when we wrestle with the difficulties of life that we may be more like jesus thank you lord that you are pro nobis you are for us Amen and Amen.